Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, we are very glad to welcome uh, Jeff and Dan from the University of Toronto. And uh, today they are going to be talking about relaxing the IID assumption. And uh, more details we will hear directly from them. Thanks very much. Thanks for having us. I'm going to uh, start this talk and I'll hand it over to uh, Jeff uh, uh, Midway. Uh, just to mention, this is also joint work, very much joint work uh, with Blair Bildo. Indeed, Jeff and Blair uh, did uh, essentially all the technical work here. Um, <clears throat> so let me start with some background and in particular a motivating example. So that of trading stocks. So you need, the problem is that you need to invest your money in a stock portfolio and you have access to several market experts who are willing to give you advice or you can really see in, in, um, maybe uh, more precisely you can you can see their trades <clears throat> and so uh, you could say interview them um, or watch their behavior and then decide uh, who to stick with uh, from now on or you could say uh, monitor the behavior and have some strategy for switching between switching your strategy based upon how well the experts are doing maybe mimicking their their strategies in some more sophisticated way now, the way that you would design such a way um, to, to use their information would be based upon some sort of, some sort of assumptions. Uh, and the main question then is, well, uh, what assumptions am I going to bring to this problem? At the end of the day, we're going to think we're going to regret not having gone with the best possible expert if we're bouncing around. We always have that regret. And, and so there's a question, what, what, what is our optimal response? And an optimal response is going to depend on some sort of assumptions. So a natural classical simplifying assumption is that say uh, the log returns are uh, um, are uh, have independent and identically distributed IID increments like say a geometric brownie motion um, that underlies black shoals of course we've seen recently with say uh, the gamestop situation that the real market is not always driven um, in such a benign stochastic way it might be driven by very much non-stochastic forces um, now, if you want to abandon, say, a nice simplifying assumption, um, one place you could come to rest would be an adversarial analysis where you assume the world is apt to get you. Um, but, you know, I would argue that's probably too, too pessimist, pessimistic for, for such situations. Indeed, if you think about statistics kind of more broadly, you, you know, you always have this challenge of you want to make modeling assumptions, they might not be quite right. So where do you go from there? You don't always want to just end up making a worst case analysis. So one, one idea is you could Kind of hope that the departure from IADness is benign, uh, but this raises a question like, how would you quantify that, right? And what would be, and what, and what would you plan for? So you could hope that the influence of non-stochastic forces was, in some sense, small. Um, maybe that's true, but this just leads to a problem of what do you mean by small again? So at the end of the day, we like some way to trade, some way to maximize profit without having to know what's driving the market, whether it be something benign or something out to get us. So we're going to pursue the question of how to behave in the situation where we don't know uh, what's driving what's what's driving the data, whether whether we're dealing with something stochastic or something adversarial. We're going to pursue that question in the framework of sequential prediction with expert advice. And I'll start by explaining this framework, uh, um, uh, kind of the, just plain sequential prediction, aka online learning. And I know there are a few people who are experts in the audience, but bear with me while I catch everyone up. So sequential prediction proceeds in rounds. Um, at each round, I'm making a prediction for an upcoming observation. Um, and this prediction can depend on historical data before that time. Then I make an observation of the outcome and I incur some loss. It depends on the prediction I made and the actual outcome. Now with sequential prediction with expert advice, um, before I make predict my prediction, I'm also receive a vector of the predictions associated with the experts. And critically, these experts and, the, and, the, and the, their performance are going to be my benchmark. I'm going to eventually compare myself to them. But let me briefly just uh, highlight the, the way that information flows in this game. So on, say, the first round, I have available to me only the expert predictions. And then I get to make my first prediction. But the second round, I have this history from the first round. And I have also the new expert predictions. And I can use all this information to make a prediction. Now, critically, there can be collusion going on. The uh, actual outcomes might uh, depend on the expert predictions. And they can even depend on my predictions. That's, that's the adversarial setting, uh, the non-oblivious one. Right, and so this kind of proceeds as usual. And so in every single round, I have some history that I can, I can, I can, I can depend on, and 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 uh, and uh, and I'm potentially fa facing experts who are colluding with the way things are going to unfold. 
So all this leads to the question of uh, how would I measure my performance in such a situation when I can't, there's not really a, a notion of uh, expected future performance when people can be colluding. So the way that you make progress is you define your performance relative to a class of your, these experts, these N experts. And you measure performance as the excess cumulative loss um, that you incur as a player over the best expert in hindsight. So here, the regret are after um, T, capital T rounds is the sum of the losses I've incurred minus the, the, the least loss. So the, minus the law, cumulative loss of the best expert in hindsight, single best expert in hindsight. <clears throat> so um, in the worst case, um, one says that the prediction problem is online learnable if one can kind of guarantee that you incur a sublinear regret. Okay. Um, now, in our situation, the expectation is going to be, we're going to be dealing with a situation that maybe some, somewhere between stochastic and adversarial, and anyways, it's going to be a complicated non-IED measure driving the data and the expert predictions. And so this expectation here is an average over those and also potentially randomness that we're using in making our decisions. But we're going to be focused on this kind of relative measure of performance. How well do we, how well do, we do compared to the best expert in hindsight? So I wanna talk about two extremes of uh, situations we might face. On one extreme, we might face a stochastic with a gap setting. So this is where the experts predictions and the data, so the outcomes we receive at every single stage are, are independent and identically distributed over time from some fixed but unknown distribution. Now the, with the gap part of this is assuming that, well, that there is some expert whose mean loss is strictly better than those of all the other experts and we'll call this gap delta. Now the other end of the spectrum or sorry, before I get there, I'll just mention that um, uh, there exist results that show that there are indeed uh, out, even simple algorithms that achieve the minimax regret, which in this case grows as log the number of um, experts over this gap delta. And this is, uh, and, and, and so in particular, there's no dependence on T here. So your regret is actually uniformly bounded. You eventually stop incurring regret. Now, at the other end of the extreme, you have the adversarial setting where you're competing against experts and predictions that are like colluding potentially to maximize your regret based upon your particular strategy and, and predictions. And we know from classic results, again, that there is a simple algorithm that achieves the minimax regret. And that regret grows like root T log N. And so you are getting more and more regret as you go. Um, you can also think about this like a root T as still imp implying that, uh, or, or being kind of uh, analogistic to uh, kind of uh, one over square root of n rates in statistical settings. All right, so this, these, two, these are two extremes. And so I might ask, is there a single algorithm that is optimal in both settings simultaneously which, without knowing which of the two settings are actually at play? And the answer to that question is yes. And so here's a particular algorithm. We've run the same algorithm in two settings, one feeding at adversarial data, one feeding at stochastic data. And you see that the same algorithm has vastly different behavior and it does kind of the right thing. So it's incurring square root of T regret in the adversarial setting and having uniformly bounded regret in the stochastic setting. And this algorithm is the kind of well-known hedge algorithm. And, this, and the result that this algorithm is optimal in both the stochastic and adversarial settings is the result, recent result due to Murtada and, and Gaifa. Uh, so <clears throat> indeed this same algorithm um, without knowing which situation it is, gets log n over delta um, <clears throat> regret in the stochastic setting and root t log n regret in the adversarial setting. Now, so this would be, seem terrific, except for the observation that um, <clears throat> in the real world, you don't think that your data are going to be perfectly IID. So that's too uh, optimistic. And in the real world, you also don't think your data are gonna be adversarial because that's a bit too pessimistic. The world's not out to get you likely. And so you'd like to be somewhere in between. And so what we do is in this work is we study a spectrum between stochastic and adversarial. This is kind of building and extending um, some ideas um, in work by Rockland, Shadar and uh, Tuari. And the basic uh, st structure of this is that we are gonna fix a neighborhood of distributions. And rather than an unconstrained adversary who can do whatever they like on each round, they are gonna be constrained to live within this neighborhood. Uh, each data point at each round is gonna be constrained to, uh, the data drawn from each round is gonna be constrained to be in this neighborhood. So here's a picture of this. So each of these triangles is a visualization of the space of probability measures on um, the, the data and expert predictions at each round. Right. So that's an, actually an infinite dimensional space, but here we're just uh, visualizing it as a finite dimensional uh, probability simplex. 
In the stochastic setting, you have the same distribution at each round. So that's indicated by the fact that this point is in the same place of this triangle each round. In the adversarial case, the adversary is allowed to bounce around and uh, they're gonna, and they, and they, and they particularly they can bounce between the extreme points, which, re which represent um, deterministic choices of exactly what data to feed you to maximize your regret. And so this, the setting that we're going to study, we're going to introduce a convex set and the adversary can still bounce around, but they're constrained to live in this within the set. And so as you can see, it's like an interpolation between these two extremes um, with uh, one extreme being a single, a single point. And they're, so they're not allowed to bounce around at all. And then the other extreme being the whole probability space, which they're allowed to make arbitrary um, moves every single round. So this is the setting we're going to study. So one question would be like, okay, what are the properties of this set that determine minimax regret? So we're going to be studying or looking for prediction algorithms that are robust to the spectrum of data generating mechanisms. And what we're more, more formally, what we're looking for is an algorithm to be adaptively minimax optimal for the spectrum of settings that we might face. So what that means is we want to achieve minimax optimal performance in every single situation. And we want to do so not requiring any advanced knowledge of which actual situation we're facing. All right. So um, even more formally, how do we how do we think about this? Well, okay, so we have some spectrum of settings, um, for example, um, represented by a, a convex constraint, as I just depicted pictorially. Now we're in some particular situation. We'll denote it by say th uh, theta, and we know in that particular situation the minimax regret would be r star of theta after capital T rounds. And what we're going to ask for is we're going to ask for a single algorithm whose um, Where's my cursor? For a single algorithm whose regret um, after t rounds is no more than some multiplicative constant c off from the minimax regret. And we want that to hold uniformly in theta, meaning that we don't need to know what the true situation is. We almost get minimax regret in that situation. All right, so at this point, um, I'm going to hand it over to Jeff, who's going to uh, walk you through our results. Can I jump in with a quick clarification kind of question? Of course, yeah. Uh, yeah. The convex set that uh, the choices of the adversary are restricted to, is that known to the learner or the learner is still like taking like the whole set of probability measures uh, as possibilities? The, lear the, learner, the learner does not know what convex constraint the adversary is restricted to. I see. Uh, okay. And you know, and the and the knowledge that it, there might be one, of course, is uh, not so useful in principle. But it, yeah. So no, it doesn't know the situation that it faces. Okay. Okay. And that's reflected, I guess, in this slide. If you think about theta as being the constraint set uh, here, then we want to not know what theta is in advance. We just want to run the algorithm, and, and whatever the constraint happened to be, uh, we will do well subject to that or relative to that. Okay, so a quick overview of what our results are before we get into more details. Uh, the first thing we show is actually that that algorithm hedge that's known uh, recently to be uh, optimal at both stochastic and adversarial uh, extremes is not uh, optimal in between them. So that's kind of surprising. I think uh, if something is optimal at two ends of a spectrum, you'd think it might be optimal everywhere in between, but it's not. And we actually set out with this project hoping to prove that it was optimal to all scenarios. So uh, more, more details, I guess, uh, and we'll learn more about what this means later. But without Oracle knowledge to tune the learning rate, which is like the only tuning parameter of the hedge algorithm, uh, then hedge is not going to be simultaneously minimax optimal at all settings between stochastic with a gap and adversarial. So we need a new algorithm that is adaptively minimax optimal if we, we hope to say that it's possible. And so we provide a new algorithm that is uh, mini, adaptively minimax optimal. So it adapts to all settings without any knowledge of which setting actually prevails. Uh, and so this is kind of the main result of our paper is that there is an adaptively minimax optimal algorithm. And we actually give an explicit algorithm that you can implement in like 10 lines of code or whatever uh, to do this. So the motivating intuition uh, between for, for what the adaptive minimax uh, rate actually is, is uh, we know in the adversarial case that the minimax regret is like square root t log number of experts. And so pretend for a moment that we were told in advance 
that N0 of the experts could ever be the best ones. So a small fraction of them could ever be uh, the best. And we know which, one of the, which ones of the experts those are then we could restrict whatever algorithm we would use in the adversarial case just to this subset of good experts. Uh, and we might strive to achieve a regret that looks like the adversarial regret, but with fewer experts. So we, we can massively reduce how big this log n is if we knew that there were many uh, experts that were not good to listen to. And on the other hand, if we knew that exactly one expert is going to be the better than the rest by some amount delta zero in expectation, but we didn't know which expert that was going to be, then we're almost in the stochastic with a gap case. And so we would hope for a regret that looks like the uh, regret in the stochastic with a gap case, which is uniform in time uh, bounded by log n over delta zero. And so uh, an important result is that the adaptive uh, minimax optimal rate of regret uh, which we do have an algorithm that achieves, is uh, split in these two cases. So we're going to learn more about what these quantities actually mean later, but it's going to be a square root of t log number of experts that could possibly be the best when there's two or more experts that could ever be the best. Uh, and it's log n over delta zero when only one expert is ever the best. So uniformly bounded in time when there's exactly one expert that's the, that can ever be the best. So let's uh, think more formally about these constraint sets that, are, that our work is built upon. So we call them time homogeneous convex constraints. And the intuition here is that uh, since the experts in the environment may collude or the expert predictions may actually be informative of what the data will turn out to be. So there's some kind of joint distribution on expert predictions and, and data then we can think of the realizations of the data and expert predictions at time t as being sampled from some adversarially chosen conditional distribution. And so what we're going to do is we're going to fix a convex set of distributions for the uh, joint uh, law of the expert predictions. There's n expert predictions and the data. And we're going to require that the uh, data at time t and the expert predictions at time t are drawn from an element of d given the history uh, prior to time t. But the choice of this distribution is made based on the outcomes of the previous round, which means that uh, the conditional law falls in this set given the history. And uh, we call this time homogeneous because this constraint set does not vary with time. And it's convex. Uh, which just corresponds to if an, if an adversary could choose two distributions or if the environment could select two distributions in this constraint set, then it's also allowed to flip a coin to pick between those two distributions and play one of them randomly. Then the environment may aim to maximize the uh, player's regret subject to this constraint. So it might select distributions from this constraint set in a way to make your expected regret as large as possible. So this constraint set could be really complicated and difficult to describe for a particular setting or application. Uh, the, the space of all convex subsets of the space of probability distributions is, is a complicated set. Uh, so we want to characterize the difficulty of learning relative to some constrained adversary using numerical quantities that simplify the abstract complexity of the constraint set and differentiate whether the data is easy or not independent of what algorithm you use uh, to, to make your predictions. And what we want is that these numerical quantities will yield matching upper and lower bounds on our minimax regret. So the first of these two quantities that we're going to introduce is the set of effective experts. So I0 here is the set of effective experts, and it's the experts that are optimal in expectation for some measure in our constraint set. And N0 here is just the number of those effective experts. And you can think of I0 as being kind of a generalization of this single best expert when you're in the stochastic with a gap setting, in which case I0 would have just been the singleton that, that picks out the one best expert. And the second quantity is going to be the effective stochastic gap. And this might look a bit complicated at first, but uh, let's unpack it from the inside out. Uh, so for every distribution in our constraint set, there's going to be some expert that has minimal loss. Uh, and that will necessarily be one of the effective experts by the definition of the set of effective experts. 
And then there's going to be some expert that's not effective that has the minimal loss among all not effective experts. And so for each measure in our constraint set, we can look at the difference between the loss of the best expert under that constraint set and the best expert that's not effective. And that gives us a gap uh, for that measure. And then we could look at the smallest gap across all of these distributions. And that's the definition of the effective stochastic gap. So that was a little bit complicated. So let's look at a picture uh, to, to understand that. But first, this is intuitively uh, analogous to what the gap was in the stochastic with a gap setting where uh, this set was a singleton and this set was a singleton. So this was just picking out the gap for that uh, single distribution. So in this example that we're going to look at, uh, we're going to have five experts whose means are jointly defined by some real valued parameter alpha. And among the five experts, there's going to be three that are effective and two that are not effective. Uh, the ones that are effective are going to have indices one, three, and five, and we'll see why they end up being the effective experts after we look at the plot. So here on the y-axis, we have the expected loss of each expert. And on the x-axis, we have the, the parameter alpha that indexes the constraint set. So each uh, vertical slice here represents one distribution in the constraint set, and then uh, we get for a particular distribution in the constraint set, we see where this vertical line intersects each of the uh, curves for each expert, uh, what the expected loss of that expert is under this distribution. So at this distribution, we find uh, that expert one had the smallest expected loss, followed by expert three, then expert two, and so on. And so if we were in the stochastic with a gap setting for this single measure, we would have that the stochastic gap uh, under this measure is the distance from uh, the expected loss of expert one to the expected loss of expert three, which is this small gap here. But if you believe me for a moment that uh, three is also an effective expert as well as one, then when we measure the effective stochastic gap, we don't compare expert one to expert three. We instead compare expert one to expert two. So expert one was the best effective expert uh, under alpha zero. And expert two was the best ineffective expert under alpha zero. And so the contribution to this infimum uh, alpha is alpha zero uh, of uh, to the to delta zero is um, this distance from the expected mean of expert one to the uh, expected mean loss of expert two. So why was expert one, three, and five the effective experts? If we highlight for each value of alpha, the minimum expected loss under each of the experts, we end up tracing out this curve. So for a period, expert five has the minimum expected loss and then expert three and then expert uh, one as we vary the parameter alpha. And so the ones which are ever minimal are one, three, and five. And they're the ones which participate in this highlighted curve. And then when we wanna compute the effective stochastic gap, we look at where the minimum of these red curves in, uh, is least separated from this highlighted region, and that is the effective stochastic gap. And something important to note here is that uh, there may be periods where a particular uh, where a particular ineffective expert is better than a particular effective expert. So, for example, way off to the right in this region, expert two can be better than expert three, even though expert two is uh, not effective and expert three is effective. So this is kind of more broad or, or more general than requiring total separation between the expected losses of the effective and ineffective experts. So let's look at some examples. Uh, the first one we've seen already is stochastic with a gap. So our constraint set is just going to be a singleton uh, containing one distribution mu zero. And so kind of by definition, we have one effective expert, which is the one with the smallest mean. And the gap is uh, the same as what the gap was by definition for the stochastic with a gap setting. At the other extreme, we have the adversarial setting where the constraint set is not really a constraint at all. It's just the set of all measures, which contains all the point masses as the extreme points. And so every expert is effective and the effective stochastic gap is uh, positive infinity kind of vacuously because it's the infimum over an empty set. Next, we can have something more general, which appeared in the same Mortada and Gaifus paper, which is the adversarial with an expectation gap. So in this setting, 
all measures uh, have a common expert, which is better than the others by some amount delta. And so by design, again, we have one effective expert uh, and the uh, stochastic gap is equal to the effective stochastic gap. Uh, next, something that's new in this work is the neighborhood of IID. So this is kind of the most intuitive uh, convex set that you could come up with, in my opinion. And so you just pick uh, some, some distribution uh, in the set of all distributions and you pick some radius and some metric and you put a ball around that distribution according to this radius and that'll give you a convex set in this set of distributions. And so if we think about this initial distribution as having a gap between each of its mean losses, then we're going to have that the number of effective experts and the effective stochastic gap will depend in some way on the radius of the ball. When the ball is very small, there's gonna be only one effective expert and uh, the, the gap will be close to the gap uh, under this initial distribution, if you thought about the stochastic gap for that initial distribution. But then as you increase the radius, the gap will shrink and then you'll have experts becoming effective and kind of rinsing and repeating and you'll get larger and larger balls that become closer and closer to the adversarial setting. And we can visualize this. So here, uh, as we increase the radius of the ball, we can think of you, you have a period where you have one effective expert until the ball becomes sufficiently large uh, that there's more distributions that are added to the ball uh, enough that that uh, there's some distribution where the ranking of the best and the second best experts switch places. And then uh, as the radius continues to increase, you'll go, uh, you'll stay with two effective experts until uh, some point where another expert changes places and you'll have a, a third one becoming effective and so on. And so it'll increase uh, with the radius or non-decrease with the radius and it'll increase into discrete increments. Next, you could ask how does the reciprocal of the stochastic gap, uh, so here delta naught inverse is the reciprocal stocha effective stochastic gap. Uh, so we're gonna find that that will increase between the jumps in the number of effective experts. So as we go from having the second best expert become closer and closer uh, to the first best expert by increasing the radius, the gap will shrink, shrink, shrink. And so it's reciprocal will blow up uh, towards infinity until, uh, until that uh, ineffective expert becomes effective and then it'll jump back down and the process will repeat. And so it resets at each of these jump points. But what we find then is that the lexicographical order on the number of effective experts and the reciprocal stochastic gap uh, respects nestedness for our constraint sets. So kind of the most intuitive thing you could think about is if you have two constraint sets uh, if one is larger than the other, it should be harder to compete with because an adversary subject to a larger constraint can do everything in more than an adversary uh, subject to a smaller constraint. So for nested constraint sets, the larger one is necessarily harder to learn against. And so we find that since uh, the number of effective experts and the reciprocal stochastic gap respects nestedness, uh, that this lexicographical order on these quantities quantifies the difficulty of learning subject to some constraint. And so you could then ask, how does the regret change with this quantity? Uh, how does the regret change with both of these quantities? And kind of particularly with the reciprocal stochastic gap, because if you think about this uh, delta naught inverse going off to infinity, uh, that might be a bit confusing. So we'll revisit a picture that's similar to the one that uh, Dan showed you earlier. So in this setting, we have the expected regret and we're looking at it both in the uh, adversarial case and in the case that there's one effective expert. And we see that for some time, they're gonna be coupled. Uh, they're gonna look almost the same up until some threshold time, after which in the one effective expert case, the regret will level off and become flat. Whereas in the adversarial case, it'll continue to increase like square root of T for the entire duration of play. And so this phase transition occurs at a time that's on the order of log number of experts over the effective stochastic gap squared. And what that means is when you have one uh, effective expert, what's gonna happen is that you're gonna incur some adversarial regret until a period where you can actually identify which expert is the good expert when there's one good expert. 
And so your adversarial regret incurred over that period is roughly square root of t0 log n. So it's the same formula, but with this kind of phase transition time plugged in. And that's where the uh, minimax regret from the stochastic with a gap case actually comes from. It's, it's coming from you essentially incur adversarial regret until some point where you can identify that uh, there's a particular expert is the best one. And then you essentially just start playing that expert and you stop incurring regret. And so we can hope that in the in-between setting when there's more than one effective expert, but uh, less than capital N effective experts, that we're going to have a sort of combination of these two bounds. There's still going to be a period that we learn which of the experts is going to be, uh, which of the, which subset of these experts are going to be effective. And hopefully that will take sort of the same duration to learn as before. And then there will be a period where you incur adversarial regret, but only uh, subject to the smaller number of experts that you actually are, are worth competing with. And the important thing is that when you see uh, the regret depends on one over delta, that does not mean that as my, like, if I fix a time to look at and I uh, increase my ball or my convex set to the point that my stochastic gap shrinks to zero, it doesn't mean that my regret blows up to infinity. It instead means that uh, under that constraint set, I'm going to be competing for a longer duration as though it was adversarial to identify which of those experts is best or which subset of the experts is best. So now let's think about the hedge algorithm uh, in order to understand its performance and, and why it ends up being suboptimal in between stochastic and adversarial. So we're going to consider finite expert classes and bounded losses. And all the algorithms we'll consider in this talk are, are called something called proper, which means that the player randomly selects an expert to emulate at each time. So the way we can think about this is that a proper algorithm is going to assign a probability distribution to the experts and it's going to select expert i with probability wi at time t. And then it'll make the same uh, action that that expert would have made at that time. So the hedge algorithm you can think of as a way to allocate these weights. And the way it's going to do that is based on some tuning parameter, uh, which is the learning rate schedule. And the way it works is that starting with weights uh, uniform on the expert, so every expert starts with equal probability of being played, we are going to define the loss of expert i as the loss of expert i. And the cumulative loss of expert i up to time t is just the sum of the uh, individual losses. And the weights played by hedge at time t are going to be given by this exponential weighting formula. So it looks kind of like a Gibbs distribution. Uh, it's going to have the exponential of the negative learning rate times the cumulative loss of that expert up to time t minus 1. The reason it's up to time t minus 1 is that my decision at time t can't depend on what my future losses will be or my, my loss will be at the end of this round. It can only depend on the history. And this eta of t here is, uh, you can think of as tempering this Gibbs distribution based on how much confidence I'm going to put in the uh, observed losses. So when this quantity is very large, I'm putting lots of confidence in my observed losses. And when this quantity is very small, I'm putting less confidence in my observed losses. So the, the standard uh, and what was shown to be optimal in the uh, stochastic and adversarial cases simultaneously was to take uh, the learning rate to be proportional to one over square root of t for some choice of c. So the standard is to take c to be a square root log number of experts. And in that case, uh, we find that when there's one effective expert, we do indeed uh, get the minimax regret, which is log n over delta zero. But as soon as you have two or more effective experts, you're going to pay for the size of the full expert class as opposed to uh, the size of the class of only effective experts. So if there were two experts that could possibly be good and 100 trillion experts uh, that could be bad, but were, were there and you didn't know which ones were good and bad in advance, for the entire duration of play, no matter how long you play for, if you use the hedge algorithm, you'll be paying for all 100, and trillion, 100 trillion bad experts uh, as well as those two good experts, which is clearly not favorable. Uh, and then 
Uh, on the other hand, the other kind of naive thing you could do with hedge is just to take C to be one. And in that case, there is kind of some weak form of adaptation where we would have the log number of effective experts not under the square root. And so this could be better uh, than, the, than the square root of log n case when n zero is much, much smaller than n. But it's still not what we were hoping for. We were hoping that this would end up under the square root, which would be as good as if we had known uh, which experts were the best ones in advance. And in both cases, there's a penalty here for the, um, for the amount of time it takes to identify which experts are good and which experts are not good. And they have different kind of burn-in period durations, which lead to different uh, values for this additive term. And for both of these results, we also have matching lower bounds. So it's not just a, uh, a like vestige of our, of our analysis. These are actually what Hedge is, is definitely getting for some choice of an adversary. So then you could ask, well, pretend that we knew in advance what the constraint set was. So we have Oracle knowledge to set our learning rate. If we were to set our learning rate to, to be this quantity, which if, if you understand how the learning rate shows up in the bound, uh, it would make sense to set it to this quantity if you could. Then with this Oracle knowledge, uh, we would have that the expected regret of hedge is, is bounded by square root T log number of effective experts. So that's what we would have wanted. And then plus this, uh, this penalty for learning which experts are effective and which experts are not effective. Um, but the problem with this is that we don't know what setting we're in in advance. So this is the best you could hope for. And you could do that if you had Oracle knowledge, but we don't want to rely on Oracle knowledge. So in all three terms, I'll just reiterate, we interpret the term involving T as the long run rate of regret accumulation after adaptation. And the log N and delta naught terms are the adversarial regret over an adaptation period that has some duration in terms of these quantities. But again, we don't know the number of effective experts. So can we learn adaptively and minimax optimally regardless? In particular, is there an algorithm for which uh, the time and number of effective expert dependence matches hedge with Oracle knowledge of the number of effective experts? And uh, the burn-in period uh, is optimal in the stochastic case when there's one effective expert because the burn-in period here uh, completely dominates the regret in that case. And uh, what we also want is that no information is needed about what setting we're actually in. And the answer is yes. So we introduced two new algorithms in order to do this. The first algorithm achieves uh, goals one and three, but not two. It has slightly worse dependence on n in the case that n zero is one. And we then introduce a second algorithm, Medicare, that accomplishes all three of these goals by boosting FTRL care, the first algorithm we introduced with hedge. And the way you can think about this is that hedge was optimal at the two extreme points at n0 equals 1 and n0 equals n. And FTRL care is optimal everywhere except n0 equals 1. And so if we can combine those two, we can get optimality at n0 equals 1 and n0 equals anything else. Uh, in order to get something that's completely adaptively minimax optimal. So how does this improved algorithm work? What is the intuition behind it? So the first of three key insights is that from our Oracle hedge bound, we know that if we could just set the learning rate to be this quantity that we don't know, we would be in really good shape. The second bit of intuition, uh, which we don't, which we haven't covered in the talk yet, but we'll get to again shortly, is that the regret of hedge closely depends on the entropy of the weight vectors that end up getting played. So um, the entropy here, it's the Shannon entropy to the quantity from information theory. Uh, and what's interesting about this quantity, in addition to it being closely related to the weights uh, that hedge plays, is that the worst case adversary will force the weights to concentrate on a uniform distribution over the set of effective experts. And in that case, the entropy of the weight vector, if the weight vector is concentrated on this uniform distribution, uh, then it'll be approximately the log number of effective experts. So what if we could just plug this in in place of the log number of effective experts and get some sort of implicit equation that looks like this in order to tune our learning rate for hedge? Well, because this is uh, implicitly defined, the weights here depend on the learning rate and the learning rate depends on the weights. Uh, it's not clear that this makes any sense yet, but we'll find that it does. Um, and the second ingredient that we're going to need 
apart from our intuition, is uh, this, the concept of follow the regularized leader. So follow the regularized leader is kind of fundamental in online linear optimization. Uh, so, so you can think of a, a, a sequence of regularizer functions that take in weight vectors and give us a quantity that tell us how regular it is or how far from a uniform it is. And uh, what follow the regularized leader says to do is that we want to pick a weight vector at time t plus one that balances two kind of objectives. We want to follow the leader. So we want to pick a weight vector that looks like it had, would have done well in the past. And we also want it to be not too far from a uniform distribution. So we want to kind of penalize how different the weight vector we, we pick is from uh, one that's uniform. So we're going to trust the history, but we're not going to trust the history too much. And head corresponds to follow the regularized leader with a particular choice of regularizer where this Shannon entropy shows up in the regularizer. You can also think about this argmin uh, that defines the weight vector as kind of the variational representation of the Gibbs distribution, which is where the, uh, the weight formula kind of comes from, if you think about it like that. And so uh, this is sort of like an elbow-like objective where we have the, the entropy of the distribution we're going to select. And so the exponential weights formula just says that the, uh, that the normalized exponential weights are the solution to this argmin problem. And so what we're going to do is just change out the regularizer here for something else. So we introduce follow the regularized leader with care. So care here stands for constraint adaptive root entropic uh, regularization. And so we've changed the entropy here just to uh, a multiple of the square root of the entropy plus something. Uh, so this is almost just square root of the entropy or like morally it represents square root of the entropy. So it's very similar uh, to the, to the uh, exponential weights formula, except that you have a different regularizer here, which is closely related to the original regularizer, but will give us what we were hoping to get in our desiderata before. So first results about uh, what this algorithm gives us. So FTRL care is almost adaptively minimax optimal. And what I mean by that is for any constraint set and any adversary uh, subject to that constraint, we're going to have an expected regret that's bounded by square root of t log number of effective experts plus uh, this, this penalty due to the burn-in period. And it's a little bit larger than we would have hoped for when there's one effective expert. So when there's one effective expert, it gets a little bit too much regret. It gets uh, log n to the three halves instead of log n. But all of the rest of the time, this is exactly what we wanted. And we didn't need to know our constraint to get there. So this works. Uh, with the same tuning parameters, regardless of what the constraint set is. But to be minimax optimal, even when n0 equals 1, we're going to combine hedge and FTRL care. So we'll just treat the predictions of hedge and FTRL care as meta experts. And then we'll use hedge to choose between these two meta experts. So it's kind of an outer hedge that wraps an inner hedge and an FTRL care. And what that's going to tell us is that we're going to incur the best of the two regrets plus a negligible excess regret from meta learning between the two. And the proof that Medicare is adaptively minimax optimal is essentially just uh, showing that this excess uh, regret that we get from meta learning is negligible, is on the same order of the rest of the regret or lower. And uh, that's our kind of main result is that for any convex constraint set D, uh, Medicare will achieve an expected regret that's bounded by square root t log number of effective experts. And when there's one effective expert, this term is zero, and we'll just get the, the minimax optimal uh, regret from this burn-in period. And when there's more than one effective expert, it'll take a little bit longer to learn which ones are the best, but eventually we'll be incurring the uh, best possible regret that you could have incurred, even if you knew in advance exactly which experts could have been the best ones. So you don't know even how many good ones there are to begin with. Yet after a burn-in period, you're doing as well as if you knew exactly who they were in advance. And the kind of uh, two details for the proof before I end the talk are uh, first that FTRL care looks like hedge with Oracle knowledge. So one of the lemmas in our paper uh, shows that FTRL care is equivalent to solving this joint system of equations, which, which motivated the, the choice of FTRL care, or I said motivated uh, what we would want to achieve. We want to set the learning rate in terms of the entropy of the weight vector. 
but also this weight vector depends on that learning rate. So FTRL care is actually equivalent to solving this joint system of equations. So it exactly achieves kind of what we set out uh, to try and do as, as a way to modify hedge to get what we wanted. And the second uh, part of the proof technique is that there's a form of concentration of measure that holds under our relaxations of the IID assumption. So for any prediction algorithm and any constraints at D and any data generating mechanism subject to that constraint, there's a version of Hoeftings inequality that holds. So uh, Hoeftings inequality lets us bound the sum of sub-Gaussian random variables, a uh, moment generating function of the sum of sub-Gaussian random variables by something that depends on uh, the, the variance of them, which it's gonna be one quarter in this case, but you, you have one term that corresponds to the accumulation of variance for these sub-Gaussian random variables. And then you have another term which uh, corresponds to the mean of the sub-Gaussian random variables that you're subtracting off. And so, this quantity says that even if your distributions are chosen adversarially from this constraint set at each time, uh, this gap from the constraint set shows up when you look at uh, the moment generating function of the uh, cumulative loss of the best effective expert. So here we have the min over effective experts. So this is the best effective expert uh, cumulative loss, subtract off any individual ineffective expert. And so this is kind of a new type of concentration of measure uh, that shows up here uh, through Hoeftings lemma, uh, which tells us that even if our data is not IAD, if it's uh, kind of weakly adversarial in the sense that it's coming from a constraint set, which has this property, uh, that it has this effective stochastic gap, then we'll have some form of concentration of measure, which we can use to say, for example, that the weights do in fact concentrate on a uniform on the effective experts. So in summary, uh, we've introduced a spectrum of relaxations of the IID assumption uh, because the data that we want to predict typically won't be purely adversarial and won't be purely stochastic. And we want to know that we'll do uh, well in all intermediate scenarios as well. And we don't want to know in advance what scenario we're in. We just want to like set it and forget it and know that we'll do well no matter what the environment happened to be. Then we characterize the minimax regret under all time homogeneous convex constraints. And we find that that minimax regret depends on the number of effective experts and zero and the effective stochastic gap delta zero. And we formalize the notion of adaptive minimax optimality. And then we prove that hedge is not adaptively minimax optimal along the full spectrum from IID to adversarial because it requires Oracle knowledge uh, to tune the learning rate in order to get the minimax optimal dependence on the time horizon and the number of effective experts. And then we provided a new algorithm, Medicare, which is adaptively minimax optimal and it performs as well as possible uh, relative to the constraint on the adversary without knowledge of the constraint of the adversary. Thank you. <laughs>